Hello, this is Ted Rayburn, the editorial page editor for the Tennessean. Uh, our editorial board is meeting today with uh, uh, Senator Joe Tidings, former Senator, U.S. Senator from Maryland, Don Benefield, uh, horse, train, horse expert, inspection expert, and Clancy. And uh, we're talking about some of the legislation uh, trying to uh, prevent soaring of walking horses in Tennessee and in the rest of the country. And uh, they're going to uh, talk about that and some of the countermeasures that are going on. So uh, we'll just start. Uh, Senator Tynes, would you like to start? Maybe talk a little bit about your background. All right. Uh, I grew up on a farm before we had tractors. We had Pertrand horses when I was a boy. And uh, <clears throat> on Sundays, it was a day of rest. Nobody worked farm boys or the perch and the horses, but we would go out in the pasture and take a halter and get on these beautiful animals and ride around. And we loved them. And uh, fortunate when I was uh, 10, my father got me a chinkatique pony. I grew up with horses. I was in the last horse cavalry outfit in the U.S. Army. I was Corporal 6th Constabulary Regiment, Horse Platoon, Army of Occupation. I love horses. Uh, at the time, I was in the United States Senate, and this was back in the 60s. I was John Kennedy protege under. Uh, I served in 65 to 71. <clears throat> and I w was approached by uh, some wonderful ladies uh, from the American Horse Protection Group uh, and told about what was happening to the beautiful Tennessee walking horses. And since I had been in the uh, horse show arena with ponies jumping and, and uh, things like that, I knew a little bit about showing. I had also seen as a boy beautiful gated horses doing beautiful, you know, gated classes, but taking a long time to train like dressage horses. And then I was told about what had happened to the Tennessee horses, walking horses, by some unscrupulous trainers and trophy-hungry owners who decided they didn't want to take the six or seven years to train a horse like they used to, but instead they could use all sorts of cruel things like acid, nails, things to almost cripple a horse's front feet, so they could start showing them when they're two years old, three years old. They could make a lot more money. They could, do a, they could cripple up 20, 30 horses in the time it would take to train six or seven horses, and that it was widespread. And I got involved, I got interested, and, um, and ultimately I introduced legislation. The original horse protection proposal I introduced in 1967, it was actually opposed by the Department of Agriculture. A lot of, a lot of resistance, a lot, a, lot, a lot of power in the uh, financial interest behind the, the walking horse industry, I mean, the show industry down here. Anyway, um, uh, so I reintroduced it in the next, uh, I guess it was 68 I first introduced it. That was the 80, uh, that was the 90th Congress. I introduced it again in the 91st Congress. I was, I, I changed committees and I was able to get the next bill, my next bill referred to committee I was on got Senator Tom Eagleton from Missouri to start helping, got, got people concerned, um, and uh, introduced legislation which became the Horse Protection Act. Senator Eagleton of Missouri helped me. In order to get it through, you had to make certain concessions, which I did, uh, and the bill was as good as we could get. It was only a misdemeanor for um, the actual violations rather than a felony, uh, which has since proved to be a great weakness. I could only get uh, an authorization for a couple hundred thousand for enforcement. It would have to be an Department of Agriculture. But after many, many days of hearings in both House and Senate, we passed the legislation. Um, I was defeated in 1970, and I'm a trial lawyer. and. I, I was, uh, I went right back, to, I'd been United States Attorney, uh, I'm a lawyer, so I went back into practice and I was trying cases across the country and the years rolled by, 
about 35 years, 34 years. And I was back in Washington, because that was where I was practicing out of, and I was interviewed by a horse magazine and asked what I we have to talk about the my horse protection act. And I said, yeah, it's great things, it's done wonderful things, hasn't it? Well, she said, I better have a, you better be interviewed. And then she told me that the situation when she interviewed me five years ago was worse than it was when we passed the Horse Protection Act. And I couldn't believe it because I hadn't been here. Right after I left, they got a powerful group of, of owners down here in Tennessee, and they put together money and what they call a PAC. And they started funneling money, Senator Mitch McConnell, Congressman Hal Rogers, and others, to, in essence, intimidate the Department of Agriculture. They successfully kept the authorization over 35 years to $200,000. You, you can't do much enforcement. And continuous pressure put on the Ag, uh, Department of Agriculture. Uh, if you do anything, if you really enforce, your appropriations are in jeopardy. And uh, with and I couldn't believe when I, when I learned what the situation was, and if anything was worse, and that the culture uh, was, and they were still showing these tragically brutalized horses at the halftime at the University of Tennessee, which was hard to believe. In any event, so I, in a sense, got back in the arena. I found out they had a wonderful group. Donna Benfield was taking the lead. Clant here was doing. Others were in the arena. Lori Northrup, a great lady, was the head of the Friends of Sound Horses, which had sort of taken over from the group that got me interested. So uh, I, I've been back, and the my bill essentially got passed because a series of articles in Life magazine exposing this at the time my bill was there. And, and it was so great that I actually adjourned my Senate hearings over to the corner of uh, Constitution Avenue, and Mrs. Blue had bought a sore, tragically sore horse named Papa Charcoal, and they took pictures, and the senator saw that, and it was effective. And here, in, in and this effort has been going very strong the last three or four years. I've, I've been able to watch it and admire all the work done by Donna Benfield and Clan and others, Lori Northrup. And um, the Humane Society has been tremendous in all, all this. And, and we've had a couple of courageous United States attorneys in Tennessee who were willing to step up and prosecute against some of these bestial practices going on against these poor horses by trainers who are being paid big bucks and their, uh, and their owners, some of whom far away from Texas, only interested in trophies, their family getting these big things and big culture down in parts of Tennessee. Um, the Humane Society was able to um, listen hear what was going on in the U.S. Attorney's Office, and they had some ideas, and they were able to get some photographs of some of the brutality. And, and you know, it's, it's so bad that they not only basically cripple for at least a period the, the horses, but in order for the horses not to flinch when they're in the showroom, when they're checking their feet, you know, their, your foot is terribly... It, Imagine some of these taxes, like the, the Chinese bamboo, uh, the Chinese torture, you stick bamboo poles in your, in your fingernails. And you're going, going. Well, that's the same thing with this tack which Donna has brought here and, and other things. In order that the horses wouldn't flinch when they picked up and looked at their foot in the show ring, they literally would take baseball bats and beat them so that if the horse knew he would flinched, he would get beaten with a baseball bat. I mean, uh, the, um, let me skip for one minute. As coming down here, uh, well, I, I better stay on course. The Humane Society did a great job, was able to get uh, photographs and of the actual practice going on, got it on national television, 
which has gave, given us great impetus. And then we got a, a very gutsy congressman from over in Kentucky, uh, Congressman Enfield, and, um, and his wife. Um, she's a horse lover. And they put in legislation, Edward Field and his wife is Connie. And he has now, he's gotten more than half the Senate and more than half the House. Now, I only had a few ghost watchers in the Senate and a few in the House. He's got half of the Senate and half the House. But because of the politics of the House and the power of Senator Mitch McConnell, they may never have a vote on either of these bills in the House. And then there's one congresswoman in, in uh, the state of Tennessee who was absolutely uh, hand in glove with the horse sores. Uh, and she's able to help too. So we even have to vote unless the people of Tennessee step up. I, I don't know whether it should it can be passed just because of that of the way things work there in Washington now. But I was as I I flew down here because we're having a conference, and I looked back at some of the old hearings back in. 69 and 70. And I looked at one um, one statement which um, sort of appealed to me. And, uh, and this was a statement of a 12-year-old high school girl in the House of Representatives. And her name was Alice Wright. I'm a seventh grade student at Columbus School for Girls, Columbus, Ohio. And she was here with 12 of her classmates, and we've written letters, Senator vote for Senator Tidings, Bill 2543. But she wrote one, one sentence, and, and she had great testimony, and the chairman over there congratulated her, and the other thing. Why, why should soaring be outlawed? And she goes, because hurting the horse's feet, natural ability, soaring, causes moral deterioration and it degrades the person who does it. And that sort of man's inhumanity to man is bad enough, but why must we take it out on animals? And that, that sort of got to me, because if you are bestial and brutal to a horse, then your whole outlook on life changes, your whole basic morality. And if you do the same with a horse, you're likely to do the same with your child or somebody else. It's just, and her, her saying, the, the moral deterioration, and that, and she had a nice long statement. She was wonderful. I mean, I didn't see her because she was in the house hearing, but th that sort of speaks it. And the other thing, for the state of Tennessee, which is such a great state, Andrew Jackson, I mean, uh, Albert Gore Sr., uh, Keith Alford, a great, people in Tennessee, and for Tennessee, they, the name of the, uh, the, uh, the Tennessee walking horses, and it's now becoming known as the center of cruelty to horses and, uh, for Tennessee. And uh, I would hope that, um, that the Tennessee senators will help get this bill passed. But it, it, it's a blot on the escutcheon of the state of Tennessee. Uh, and you don't realize it, but now, Tennessee is starting to be connected with Tennessee walking horse cruelty, bestiality to animals. Um, you say that you fear that it won't pass without the people of the state of Tennessee. I, I find it interesting that there's only one uh, congressman in the whole state who's, who's supporting it, and that's the PAST Act, I mean, and that's called it. Representative Cohen, I wonder how the bill can do when it's, it is the Tennessee walking horse, as you say, it's the state of Tennessee, and you can't get a, a single representative behind it except for Cohen of Memphis. Well, you have, a, the culture is so sad in Tennessee, the back, background, plus you got to look at the money, and you got to look at the money flowing in, and where it's coming from, and to whom it goes. And unfortunately, uh, in the present situation, uh, when congressmen run for office, they have to spend 
maybe a third of their time raising money and what have you. And when you have tremendous money interests back who want the trophies, who want the ribbons, and a lot of them aren't even from Tennessee. They're owners from Texas or other states, Alabama or someplace, and they come up because you have the biggest shows here. And they come up into Tennessee. I mean, the, the beautiful walking horses all over everywhere. It's got the name of Tennessee, and that used to be a great plus for Tennessee until they started this, the owners and trainers started this bestiality for ribbons and for money and what have you. And uh, it's only been going on for about 40 years, 40, 50 years. Uh, before World War II, we didn't have this. And it should be stopped now, and I think it could be stopped. It's very close. You've got more than half the United States Senate and more than half the House of Representatives all and all, all co-sponsoring this bill. I only had two or three senators on mine and maybe six or eight, ten House representatives, and we got it through. But it's, it's easy to block now. It's much easier to block. And you've got the politics, and you've got one uh, congresswoman here in Tennessee who, who knows how to play uh, play ball and and and, uh, and and she's you know she's hand and glove in the pocket with the people that put all up the money to soar the horses and what have you and she's uh, she's a very effective worker and uh, and your Tennessee senators I think uh, they're neutral they're, they're not taking a position one way or the other and it's very sad for me I love Tennessee I I used to drive all the way from Baltimore to Johnson City to date a beautiful young lady before I was married <laughs> and drive all night back, get back to practice law. She, she was wise and picked a much better man to marry, but I tried. <laughs> Probably had a faster car. <laughs> uh, so uh, all of these PIs, see, I was surprised that so many people signed on to the bill, not because it's not a good bill, but just because here there's so much opposition to it. So my question is, is it just easy for those lawmakers who already signed on to it because they don't have much of this in their state, that it's no, easy no. to... No, you you, have, ten, you have walking horse shows, big shows, all over the South, in Virginia, um, and you have you have walking horse gated horse shows everywhere, and in in Europe, you, the walking horse shows are four or five times bigger than this, but there are no soaring, no soaring there. And now, unfortunately, in some of our states around, there is soaring. They, they do do that, but um, I think it's because the political power structure or the, the political power interests, the lobbying interests, the money interests in Tennessee are so powerful that they have, in essence, kept the Tennessee uh, leadership from taking a position to, to try and save the horses. When neither of your United States senators will get stand up and be counted, you know there's a reason because they're, they're I mean, they're good I've known Lamar Alexander for 30 years, fine guy. and. Why he, he, he won't support this? Well, one of, isn't one of his leading uh, money raisers uh, uh, in, in, the, in the business? I, I have heard that, but I, I don't know personally. But I certainly have, have heard that his finance chairman is one of the big uh, fundraisers in the whole soaring industry. But I don't know that personally. But I'd I like to address that. I'm sure. Would you like me to? Please. please. Sure. Well, here is a copy of a ticket given to Mr. Steve Smith, who is the Republican finance chairman for Senator Lamar Alexander. He also has made uh, considerable contributions to Congresswoman Marsha Blackburn, who is the face of animal abuse now here for the entire state of Tennessee. And it's really a disgrace to, to think that we have people that can be purchased so cheaply. She received $70,000 from the Walking Horse Trainers Association recently, and it was after that she then introduced her alternative legislation to counter the PAST Act that was introduced by Congressman Ed Whitfield. And as Ed Whitfield has stated in numerous meetings that the worst center of the abuse for soaring is here in the state of Tennessee. 
the second worst is in his district, which is why he introduced the bill, because he thinks it's not healthy. Um, Before you go, I, I, I mangled your title at the beginning, so would you just kind of explain who, what your background is? And yeah, what sure, I'd sure. be happy to. Donna, Donna is a Hollywood star. I mean, Donna, Donna has a great background, not only in the horse field, but... Go ahead. Just for the few people who have seen it. Yet, so. Okay, well, by profession, I was in the film industry and did TV movies of the week and TV series and occasionally an expose on the corruption in the walking horse industry, as was featured on CNN Special Assignment, on Current Affairs, and there have been several others. Um, as my hobby, walking horses were my hobby. I've shown them. I had a world grand champion I showed here. Um, I had about 20 horses in my barn that I trained and showed myself. Early on in being involved in this industry, I was exposed to the soaring, and I found it pretty appalling. And I decided that I felt that I had the ability to maybe make a difference, so I stepped in and actually stepped up to vocally oppose what was going on with numerous threats. Um, there was a contract on me. It was headlines in the Nashville, Tennessee, and we had the FBI guarding my husband and me for about three years. So they, they, they like to play rough. but. As I told them, you know, that I don't have a lot of backup in me, and after they killed one of my horses and poisoned another one, I said, now I'm going to make you my hobby. And so I've moved here to Tennessee, and now I'm a resident. Um, I have been the head of uh, several USDA certified inspection programs that inspected horses all over the United States. I personally have examined hundreds of thousands of horses myself and had hands-on. I've been involved in the training of the inspectors for all of the HIOs, the majority of them, and of the veterinary medical officers for the USDA. So I have pers personal knowledge of what's going on. I actually, in 2010, worked for the uh, Tennessee National Celebration, the World Championship, as a consultant and advisor, and uh, had full reign over the entire showgrounds to look at horses, bring them in for inspection if I saw something that wasn't right. So I have a broad, um, and I also testified in Congress in November uh, regarding the issues that we're discussing here today. Um, what I just handed you was the Steve Smith ticket, and that shows you that from very high up, his father was the one that originally got Senator McConnell involved, and that was back in 1988 when the courts and Judge Gash uh, handed out the decision to the department to rethink their position on the use of pads and chains. So that put a stop to the show back in 88. And there was a Senate, uh, there was a meeting at the Senate that I attended back then, and I've attended almost every meeting, hundreds and hundreds of meetings in Washington since then. But at that time, they rewrote the regulations addressing the use of the pad and chain, which now they, it was reduced from a 10-ounce chain now down to what's called a 6-ounce chain. The pad was then reduced in size. It used to be maybe 4 or 5 inches tall. And now, as you see this pad over here um, next to Ted, with, that is now, would, the size of that shoe to be legal would have to be 50% the natural length of the natural toe of the horse. And I know that uh, David Howard's son, David Howard being the chairman of the celebration, the National Celebration of World Championship, his son, Jeffrey Howard, I believe, appeared before your yes. Tennessee editorial board. Yes. And I remember watching the video, and I was really pretty surprised to the extent that he would go to misrepresent some things to you. For example, he stated that that stack is weighs oftentimes less than a lady's tennis shoe. Well, as you can see, and we'd be happy I brought scales, we can weigh these things. The scale doesn't go up that high. That shoe weighs approximately close to 10 pounds. So you have 10 pounds on each foot, so it's a combination of 20 pounds on the front end of that horse. And I've even weighed some of the stacks that go up to 15 pounds. Um, they are not less than a lady's tennis shoe, so that's a gross misrepresentation. Um, another thing that was commented on was that the industry has a, a good working relationship with the USDA, uh, which is another gross misrepresentation. They have been issued letters 
uh, a notice of decertification, and the USDA now has uh, filed charges against the show, the celebrations inspection program called SHOW. And they're up for decertification along with another USDA certified inspection program called Heart of America in Missouri. So it does not appear to me that they have a great working relationship. Another claim that is made is that this is isolated to only a few individuals. Well, I'm here to tell you. This stack right here, as you can see, and you're it's all in alphabetical order. You can see that it's all single-spaced. These are just a few of the violations of the Horse Protection Act. That is hardly isolated to a few individuals. And then we have re records here from the 2011 Riders' Cup, which is a trainer's point competition. And this is the 2000, or two, yes, 2011 Riders' Cup. And you can peruse through this, and I think it was either 2010 or 2011. Of the top 20 trainers in the industry, 100% of them had violations for soaring or violations of the Horse Protection Act. And then in 2012, the top trainers, Riders Cup winner was Charlie Green, awarded a $15,856.72. And I believe that's from the Walking Horse Report of the Celebration, one or the other. And, well, it says the Walking Horse Trainers Association, so it must be with them. But to be awarded, and then if you look at these records, Charlie Green has an enormous number of 22 violations from one foot sore to two foot sore. And scarring. So here is an article that I think you put out with that record. Here is the 2011 Trainers um, Cup, Riders Cup uh, results. And it, I think it was 2010, it was 100%, and 2011, it was 80% of all the top 20 trainers had violations. If that's not correct, then it's the other way around. It's either 2010 or 2011. So, as you can see, that long list, and they're pretty notable trainers. So that was a gross misrepresentation to the Tennessean and to the general public of Tennessee. Here are the 2012 foreign substance results from the USDA. This tells you what the, um, what the various chemicals are, and also um, the shows and what the count was at the shows with regard to their findings. Now, the source side of the industry says they claim that they want more science. Currently, what is being used is digital palpation as one form of detection. And if anyone has ever been to the doctor with something sore on them, what's the first thing your doctor does? He palpates the area. That's not uncommon in medicine. That's an accepted standard practice. In addition to that, they're using the thermo thermograph machines, which measures heat in the legs, and it'll give you um, readings on hot spots, and now they're using it to identify also cold spots because the industry now has become extremely familiar on how to get by inspections and get the horses through, so what they're doing is they're numbing the horses. They also have what they call a uh, gas chromatography mass spectrometry, which is the um, GCMS. And it's where they swab the pasterns to identify what's been put on the leg. For example, when you go to the airport, if you've had a computer that they pulled you off to the side and they've swabbed your computer with a little piece of cloth, and then they put it in the machine and it identifies what's on the computer from looking for explosive. It's basically the same thing, except they're identifying caustic chemicals and compounds thereof. Uh, to avoid detection in that, what they are now doing is they're partnering up with a lot of the veterinarians down in central, Middle Tennessee who are instructing the trainers on how to get through inspection, and what they do is they numb the legs through injections called a nerve block, and they will inject 
into the nerve at the vascular groove or vascular bundle on the pastern, which is where your uh, artery, vein, and nerve is located. It will block that leg so that they will pass inspection and will go undetected with a swab because it's now inside. Um, in addition, so that's also another part of the science that's currently being used. Additionally, they use digital radiograph to identify foreign objects placed under the foot. For example, here is what's called a bolt. What they do is they will take this bolt and they will put this up, leaving this nut in place, they will put this up into the frog of the foot and it will be braced on either side of this metal piece inside the, the edge of the shoe to hold it in place and then they'll crank it down. Well, actually it's this way around. They'll crank it down and they'll drive this up into the frog and have the horse stand on that for hours, 24 hours. Uh, one trainer recently who served jail time for it, he was even caught with it still in the foot when he went through inspection. This has become extremely common because the inspections have gotten more scientific. Palpation, radiography, thermograph, GCMS, we need to go somewhere else. So what they do is they go where we're not looking. So they've gone to the bottom of the foot. Currently, the USDA has not gotten involved in pulling the shoes to see what's going on under that foot, which they really should, and so should the inspectors. But the industry, the source side of the industry basically claims foul play, you know, it's a liability if you make us pull a shoe and if you don't find anything. Well, I would think that you really, you would, your goal would be to find nothing under there. But it's, it's the, the practice. Another thing they use are these um, bit burrs. Stick them under the girth to create pain, to distract the horse so he passes inspection. And this one is also, what they do is sometimes is cut them in half and place them under the, the girth. Wait, what's the girth? I'm sorry. The girth is the oh, piece the of leather that goes oh, on the, the bottom of the belly. The horse. Oh, it's like the belt that holds the saddle. the saddle on. That now has been addressed, so they don't allow anybody to bring the horse through inspection any longer with the um, saddle. So these, these are springs that are used on the frog of the foot to create pain. And they'll put that up against the frog, and these points will go up against the, the bars of the foot. Um, in order to get through the uh, scar rule portion of the, the law, they will wrap the horse in slather salicylic acid onto the horse's leg and let him cook there for about 24 to 48 hours, wrapped in plastic. The horse will lay in the stall, moaning and growing. It's, it's the most brutal thing you've ever seen. I remember one horse laying there, it was just almost crying in so much pain, broke out in a sweat and I ended up taking, it was at somebody else's barn, I ended up taking water to it. It was just gross. They then removed the plastic from their legs and then they take this real fine comb and they comb the tissue off the leg and down the shaft of the hair to remove the thickening and evidence of soaring and scarring. So with all of this said, all these numerous things, and there's right there in front of you are these two heavy shoes, which I think the public probably needs to see these. These are, as you can tell by the, these are not light. These are part of the weighted shoes, and I have a scale here. I think this weighs somewhere around three to four pounds. They also are, have resorted to the heaviest metal you can use on a shoe now, which is called tungsten. Those can weigh anywhere from 10 to 15 pounds per foot. So this now all takes us back to why do, oh, and then they have the, the alligator clips. These are put on the scrotum of the horse the vulva of the mare, the tongue, all to create pain to get them through inspection. They will use all these chemicals here, including this, tattoo ink, etc., to cover up the scars so they can make it through inspection. Mustard oil they use. And I was, and I, yes, and I had the mustard oil and I thought maybe, I didn't know what your security here was, and I thought I probably wouldn't make it through security with oil, oil and mustard. <laughs> it's pretty potent. It's the same thing that they Horrible. use in mustard gas, and it's I do horrible. have a thing and of it.